But what I find fascinating is that maintenance is the most dangerous place there is. Being stuck in the ever-repeating known is waving the flag of irrelevancy for destruction to come through and clean house. Does that mean then, I mean, that state that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you can get there also during the actual sex act? Mm -hmm. What I have found over my 20-something years of doing spiritual work is that it's the simplest revelation and is that the feelings simply want to be felt. And yeah, no, no joke. So don't <laughs> don't anyone just try this at home. But yeah, but because it has this neurotoxin in it, in mm -hmm. I bet, and it's a biologic, I bet that there's probably some healing benefit of it. But what that pleasure does to your ability to believe that you deserve those dreams. Because I, I think we don't get what we want in life. We get who we are. And who we are is made up of, of what we believe we deserve. Can I open yep. us up with a little quick opening prayer, opening invocation? I would like that. I was going to ask you to do that as well. Oh, okay. Because I know you've taught 50,000 people how to meditate. You know, I actually think we're, it's, it might be like 350,000 now. 350,000? Wow. <laughs> because if you go with the well, book. I, I'm, I'm quoting Andre. I'm quoting Andre, and clearly he, he was not up to date on that well, one. It just depends on if you're going by the book and then everyone I've taught through Mind Valley, but through Ziva, it's been 50. Just open up a little little prayer. So just go ahead and close the eyes. Please. Big deep inhale into your heart. Exhaling on the sound of ah, uh, the sound of God. Uh. Another even bigger breath into your heart, increasing the size and amplitude and frequency of your heart. And as you exhale, imagine it merging with mine through the field. Uh. This time, let's breathe all the way down into our hoo-hahs. And yes, everyone has one. Exhaling two beautiful golden cords all the way down into the core of the planet. Feeling that beautiful anchoring down into yourself, anchoring down into the planet. And then bringing our awareness eight inches above our head and activating our crown, our halo, our cosmic antenna for pure creative intelligence to flow through. Feeling that simultaneity of groundedness into the earth and our cosmic antennas on so that we can be a vessel, a channel for pure creative intelligence, the frequency of pure love, whatever it is that nature would have us know, say, share, or cognize for ours and everyone's highest good. Feeling our hearts starting to get into coherence with our bodies, our hearts starting to get into coherence with ourselves and tapping into the consciousness of everyone who will witness this past, present, and future so that they can receive the exact medicine they are meant for, no more, no less. And so it is. Oh. Thank you so much. Mm, my pleasure. So let's go ahead and... Uh get into this. I'm so excited to have you here with me today, Emily Fletcher. Emily is, um, I don't know how best to describe you. You've done so many things. You have, I just learned, taught meditation over 350,000 people. You're the founder of Zeba. You're on the speaking circuit for Mind Valley. You have been a very prolific podcaster as well. I've been quoting you. You may not even know this, but I've been quoting you time and time again, uh, especially your your one quote in particular, which is the, the one divides itself in the many simply for the joy of becoming one again. Mm -hmm. And you've had a profound impact on my life. Mm -hmm. And I love how you tackle taboo subjects uh, and make them completely no longer taboo it's it's uh you use quite a lexicon uh like you've already used on this conversation with us together uh that is unique let's say and um you really take on subjects that i think arrest and demand that we be captivated mm -hmm. by what you say and uh i think you have a very powerful throat chakra and that's why i wanted to invite you on to this podcast, and I'm very excited to have you with me today. Oh, Robert, it is such an honor to be here. 
the more I know about you, the more excited I am to know you. And I want to say thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. Thank you for merging the head with the heart. And hopefully we'll bring in a little bit of hoo-ha today because, you know, we need all of it. Bring the hoo-ha. All parts of us online. <laughs> That's right. What would the world be without a hoo-ha? It wouldn't exist, right? It wouldn't so, exist, right? It is the matrix point for civilization. So Exactly. So tell me, tell me your story. I'd love to hear your story. What led you to this moment in time where we're having this conversation now? Yeah. So I grew up as a little girl. I wanted to be on Broadway. It's all I really wanted. I wanted to sing and dance and act and perform. And I went to my first Broadway show when I was 10. And, and then I got my first Broadway show when I was 22. And three weeks later was the saddest I had ever been. And I had the gift of realizing at a very young age that I was more interested in the happiness of pursuit than I was the pursuit of happiness. But I didn't quite understand that at 22. I just thought, oh, my happiness must be in the next show or the next boyfriend or the next agent or the next zero in the bank account. So I performed on Broadway for about 10 years. And then I found meditation. And I should share that by the time I got to my last Broadway show, I was suffering from a, a severe anxiety uh, insomnia. I could not sleep through the night for about 18 months. I was going gray in my late twenties. I was getting sick and injured all the time. So here I am living my dream, doing the thing I had wanted to do since I was a little girl and I was miserable. And in hindsight, I can see what a blessing this is because so many people go their whole lives under what I call the I'll be happy when syndrome. They just think it's that next boyfriend, that next girlfriend, that next acquisition, that next million, that next hire. And, and they never actually realize that it's always right inside. It's always here. It's always now. And so by achieving my lifelong goal at 22, the, the bigger gift beyond the goal was that realization. And so, but it took me a little while to catch up. So finally, here I am like suffering from anxiety, going gray, getting sick and confused. Like I did it. Like I'm at the top of the top. It doesn't get any higher than Broadway. Why am I so sad? And then I learned to meditate. And it wasn't just an app. There were no meditation apps back then. <laughs> um, and so I took a course, I actually went to a place and I took a course. And on the first day of my first course, I was in a different state of consciousness than I had ever been in before. I was transcending time. And then that night, I slept through the night for the first time in 18 months. And I have every night since. And that was now 16 years ago that I learned to meditate. And then it changed my life so profoundly that I thought, why isn't everyone doing this? That's the name of my podcast. Why isn't everyone doing this? Because when I find something that works, I cannot help myself, but I want to shout it from the rooftops. So I left Broadway. I went to India. I started what became about a three-year training process to teach. So it was not acute weekend certification in yoga. Like it was a very in-depth study of the Vedas and transcribing Sanskrit by hand and apprenticing while thousands and thousands of people learned to meditate. And it was a bit more akin to getting a PhD in the Vedic sciences than, than a yoga certification. And, and it was just, I could not get enough, like just drinking to that quote that you said, the one became two for the joy of becoming one again. Like if I had to summarize the entirety of the Vedas into one sentence, it would be that. So then I started Ziva back in 2010 and had an amazing time teaching people to meditate. And I really, I'd say what I hung my hat on was framing meditation as a performance tool right? Like because of my performance background, because of the types of people I was teaching, I was teaching like NBA players, Oscar award winners, Olympians, Fortune 100 CEOs. So, and back in 2010, meditation was still weird. Like, believe it or not, meditation was taboo back in 2010. Like there was, there wasn't a million apps. Online courses were weird. So I actually created the world's first online meditation training and it was an experiment. Like I didn't know if it was going to work or not. I didn't know if it would, if people could learn through a computer screen. And it turns out they can. It did end up changing people's lives. Um, I wrote a book called Stress Less, Accomplish More in 2019. And it became a bestseller and it really sort of changed the game for me. And then 2020 happened <laughs> and the whole world changed. The frequency of the whole planet changed. Mm -hmm. And I was no exception to that. I felt like, and this is just my experience, but I'm curious to know yours. It felt like we went from this sort of ma masculine, external, like, achievement oriented society into one that is a bit more internal. Like, can I get into alignment with my desires? Can I magnetize my desires? Can I listen? Can I receive? So it went from sort of feeling hyper-masculine into more feminine. And so in mm -hmm. that, I made a big change personally. I, I got out of a 10 year marriage, even though I had a two year old son and this man was the CTO and CFO of my company, amazing man, amazing father. And we graduated. We graduated from that relationship 
And three weeks after I asked for the divorce, I met Layla Martin, who is my best friend and amazing world famous Tantra teacher. I met my cosmic love, Adam. And then a few weeks later, I moved in with Regina Thomas-Shower, AKA Mama Gina, uh, who is famous for her New York Times bestselling book called Pussy, A Reclamation. And so it feels like nature started fire hosing me with this makeshift PhD in sacred sexuality and in Tantra. And it was, I was like, nice, thank you. Like, I really appreciate this. But it, it felt bigger than that. It felt like, hey, you know that thing you did for meditation? You know how you helped to make it attractive and accessible to a mainstream audience? Well, now it's time for you to do this with these even more potent and even more taboo modalities. Because guess what? Mm -hmm. World's about to get really intense. And just like when someone is sick, they need more potent medicine. And it feels like right now the species, the unsustainable paradigms are starting to be destroyed. And so we are going to need more potent medicine to come in to birth this new earth that our hearts know is possible to quote our friend, Charles Eisenstein. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Mm -hmm. That, that is a lot to unpack. So let's rewind just for a moment. Mm -hmm. What was it like to leave Broadway? Mm. When I did it, I didn't know I was leaving. Like I was sort of tricking myself into thinking like, oh, teaching meditation will be a cute side job. Like I'll just do this in between shows or I'll do this when I'm not working. Cause I was, I mean, my identity was really wrapped up in being an actress. Sure. And so mm -hmm. it was, it was hard for me to leave it. But I think I, I just, I titrated it to where I would turn up the volume on the teaching and turn down the volume on performing. And then there was this one month where I was in final callbacks to play the lead role Velma Kelly in Chicago, the musical on Broadway. So I was in final callbacks for that. I was opening up the East Coast division of the number one acting school in LA. And I was in the middle of creating and birthing the world's first online meditation training. And I was like, wait a minute, like nobody wins here. Like I'm not gonna be able to do any of these three things well. And that's the week I called my agents and I was like, I love you, but my heart is not here anymore. Cause they'd be like, Emily, can you bring us headshots and resumes? This is back when they used to be paper. I'm really dating myself now. And, and I would say, sure. And then I wouldn't bring them any, but I would have taught 300 people to meditate. So my, my, my body was voting for me, even though my, my attachment to who I was hadn't quite ca caught up. Um, so it was sad. And I'd say, I remember about a year later, I was watching the Tony awards, uh, like a, a live stream of the Tony awards. And I just mm -hmm. cried and cried and cried, but this is years after I had already left. So oh. you had, why did you cry? I think because of the loss of that version of Emily, like I, it was a rebirth of sorts, like that Emily had to die in order to step into this one. And there was so much joy and, and friendship and family in that chapter, but there was also so much un, untapped potential. You know what I mean? Like I sort of knew that I was meant to be on really big stages and, and yet the ego was trying to figure out, well, where is it? Is it through this path? And so in leaving that, I had to let go of that potential uh, and like mourn all the shows I didn't get and all, you know, all of that. But I will say that after I left, after I quit, and I'll name drop for a moment, I got invited to, to sing at Marvin Hamlish's memorial concert. Marvin Hamlish is one of the two people uh -huh. on the planet who's a PI. Very famous, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he was the composer and lyricist for a chorus line. And so I was sandwiched in between <laughs> Liza Minnelli and Aretha Franklin. And then Barbara Streisand was the last person to sing. And that's when I just sort of <laughs> dropped the mic and was like, I'm never gonna top that. So <laughs> that'll, that'll be a good swan song. <laughs> that's pretty epic. That's quite a lineup to be on that yeah. lineup. Yeah. On that headliner. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really identify with what you just said. Uh, it resonates deeply for me because I, I felt very often the same way. Mm. And, I, and letting go of an identity. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, Aubrey Marcus's team made this video of when I was at, um, with you, I, I think you were there at Arcadia, uh, yep. last year. Yeah. And, um, and, it was funny because I got on stage and I said, you know, I used to be, I was a pharmaceutical CEO. And then they put this music behind it. It was like, dun, dun, dun. You know, I heard it. Throat. I thought you had done that. I thought you had done a sound effect on stage. They did that in post, which is even funnier. <laughs> yeah, no, it was really funny. And I, I just thought to myself, I'm like, well, it's not like I'm lamenting no longer being a pharmaceutical CEO. Mm -hmm. Right. But there is a an aspect of it wasn't like my life was bad yeah yeah i had a good life um you know and i and i kind of walked away 
almost entirely from that life. And there's parts of it that I still have nostalgia for. You know, I'm a Taurus. Taurus are very sentimental. Mm. It's the best way to get to our emotions is to get to our sentimentality Mm. and through nostalgia. And for me, I had like this nostalgia for my former life. And I remember the day that, uh, that, you know, we had the first lockdowns for COVID. And I remember looking outside and I, I grew up in England. I moved to Nebraska when I was like, you know, 14 years old. And, and I had a good life. I mean, even driving around through cornfields and stuff like this, you know, I, I had a really good life. I never felt like the world was against me per se. I felt like the world was with me. I was always an optimist, even at that stage of my life. And I had to go through this period of mourning the old life because I knew in, you know, March of 2020 that that world was finished. I'm glad that you got that memo and that you allowed yourself to mourn it. I think that part of what we're seeing right now on the planet is people's unprocessed grief that has, that, is starting to, you know, want to be paid, like the piper wants to be paid, then our bodies are a perfect accountant. I remember also it was many months into the pandemic and and New York City, especially Manhattan, was a ghost town. And I rode my bike over the bridge and I had a studio, I had a meditation studio in Soho. And I walked in, I hadn't been in it in like seven or eight months. And there was like rat poop on the ground and it just felt stale in there. The air was thick with stagnation. And I remember I just instinctively started fluffing the pillows and straightening the, the, the blankets. And I knew intellectually how absurd this was. Like I knew I was likely never going to teach meditation in there. I knew likely there would never be another student in this space. And I felt like I was putting lipstick on a corpse is what the, the phrase that came in. I was like, oh, I'm fluffing pillows on something that has already died. And, and it was, again, another morning. I remember I just sat in the middle of the studio and I wept because I had a really good life. Like even that version of of my life of teaching live in a studio and having this vibrant community in New York City, that died then too. And so as sad as it can be, and as much as it must be mourned and grieved, if we are not willing to die to who we are, then we cannot step into who we can become. And and this is just the, the constant lesson. Every medicine ceremony, every breathwork journey, every new code install on the planet. Like, so Layla and I just went to Greece this summer and we went on this priestess pilgrimage and we went to Eleusis and Delphi and, um, <clears throat> and Crete. It's inspired by the book, The Immortality Key by Brian Moresco. And so we were going to these sites where these priestesses would do fertility rituals or medicine rituals. And, and these world leaders and generals and poets and theologians and philosophers would come and experience these ceremonies. And specifically in Eleusis, they would go to die before they died. Right? And they say that you hadn't really lived unless you had experienced the Eleusinian mysteries. And so the more I'm, I'm embodying this, I'm recognizing that we must be brave enough to truly step into the unknown, which is also a big Vedic principle. Like according to the Vedas, there's no such thing as good or bad. There's no such thing as right or wrong. There is only creation, maintenance, and destruction. And it sounds nice to be leading with creation. It's like, oh, I'll just be making finger paints and watercolors. But no, like to, to birth something is terrifying, dangerous, scary, hard work. If you're really birthing something new because you are stepping into the unknown and you must die what needs to shed. Like even a mother, right? When you birth a child, your maidenhood dies, right? And your, your life is in, is in question for a moment as that veil becomes thin as you're birthing another being. And so leading with creation might sound nice, it might sound easy, but it actually is, is intense. But what I find fascinating is that maintenance is the most dangerous place there is. Being stuck in the ever repeating known is waving the flag of irrelevancy for destruction to come through and clean house. And so the more I've embodied this principle of creation, maintenance, and destruction and been willing to die to who I am to step into the new version, actually the more elegant and, and flow and joy I experience in life. So, okay. So what was it for you that triggered your spiritual awakening? Mm. Was it the trip to India or what had it already happened at that point? Wow. It feels like it's just been such a long, gradual process. Like I knew even as a little girl that I would be teaching people. 
I didn't know exactly what, but I knew as, as I knew as a little girl, I was like, oh, I think meditation. I know I'll be teaching people. And then I would say learning to meditate that, that day that I got initiated was a big wake up for me just to be able to experience something other than my intellect, other than my left brain. And then I've been working with medicine, like plant medicines for about 22, 24 years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I wouldn't like in sometimes ceremonial settings, but often just recreationally. And now I have this alter ego. Her name is Julie Cruz, director. <laughs> and she really <laughs> likes to make sure that everyone is doing the same thing at the same time and is on the same ride and makes it very ceremonial. And I used to make fun of Julie. I used to sort of um, think she was too controlling, but now I re recognize that this might've been my priestess, like this like medicine blessing woman who wanted everyone to be in community and really like take the ride seriously. Um, <laughs> so, you know, ongoing through plant medicine. And then I would say, I, there have been many, many initiations in the realm of, of physicality and in sacred sexuality, but there's been a few. One, I did a Bufo ceremony three years ago and forget about seeing the face of God. I remembered that I am the face of God. It was like unequivocal, more love than I'd ever experienced in my life. And then that was also that time where, you know, all, all these people and teachers started coming into my life. Um, and then I would say, honestly, the divorce as well. And here's why because I would consider myself a recovering codependent and a recovering people pleaser. And so to actually choose the truth and to choose myself and to be willing to um, hurt someone's feelings was a, was a huge initiation for me. And, and like one of the bravest things I've ever done because um, it was the last thing I wanted to do. And then I think because of that bravery, because of the level of fear that I was able to move through, I think nature was like, hey, I, I love the Glennon Doyle quote, uh, the braver you are, the luckier you become. Um, and then in the past few years, what's been wild is just like unexplicable things like light language coming through my body, moving in ways that don't really make sense to me, <clears throat> like really feeling truly like a vessel and things that my, my intellect does not quite understand but I'm willing now to just open up and say like, you know, please use me. Um, I would say mm -hmm. I have a very beautiful and intimate relationship with Isis. And, the, and that's, that's the first time I've ever anthropomorphized God is when I started to develop a relationship with Isis, the Egyptian goddess of sex and magic and fertility and even sex magic. And that's been a big part of my work the past three years is, is taking the idea that we could use the most creative force that we have, which is our sexual energy, and use it to create reality. Like this has been the subject of my passion and, and study over the last three years. And that's, so sacred secret is what we're birthing there. And that's just been initiation after initiation. So, okay. So mm -hmm. what does sex magic mean to you? First of all, it is the most successful clickbaity title on anything on YouTube which is pretty amazing. But yeah. what does it actually mean to you? What does sex magic mean to you? It definitely captures everyone's attention. I know. It's so funny because as you're saying that, I just spent about a year and about $45,000 working on a whole brand to make a thing that so we don't have to use the term sex and magic. <laughs> and as you're saying that, I'm like, did I just totally waste a year of my life in $45,000? Well, I mean, because, sex is already pretty amazing yeah. and then throw magic into it. Like yeah. that's like, I, I, you don't need to be a mathematician to figure out that the sum of those two things <laughs> is going to be something greater, right? <laughs> than its parts. Yeah. And yet my hypothesis was, okay, Emily, like if you're really going to be the bridge, right? If you're going to take this medicine to people who right now do not like to say the word sex are offended by the word magic, put those two things together and it becomes very inflammatory. It was like, oh, we're going to need different words. So I'm calling it pleasure prayer. And so I would say what sex magic means pleasure to me prayer. is using your pleasure to pray. Nice, nice use of alliteration there. I love alliteration. <laughs> so I'm like head, heart, and hoo-ha, pleasure prayer. I got, I got lots of them. <laughs> um, pleasure but, prayer. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Thanks. But the idea, so, so I was taught by Layla Martin, who's an amazing teacher, and then I'm sort of pulled it, but I've been teaching manifesting for five or six years. And so I took one of my favorite subjects and then am now combining it in this more embodied way. So I've been teaching manifesting from the neck up for five years and it works. Thoughts become things. What we put our attention on grows. Yeah. We know mm -hmm. that. But now if we can start to get the desire into the body, if we can start to feel the dream in all of the energy centers, a couple of things happen. One, I found that people's biggest obstacle when they're manifesting is that they're like, Emily, I don't know what I want. 
Like I want to manifest, but I actually don't know what I want. And I think especially in women, we've become so divorced from our own desire from just, you know, tens of thousands of years of slut shaming. And I think it happens to everyone to some degree, but especially for women, they, they cut themselves off from their own sexual and physical desires. And then it becomes harder to hear what the desire is out in the world. So as you start to reclaim your body, as you start to reclaim your pleasure, it actually becomes easier to hear what your desires are. You start to believe that you deserve those desires because the more pleasure you allow in your nervous system, the more deserving power you have, the more you believe that you deserve those dreams. So it's not just about using the pleasure to magnetize the dream. It's also about what that pleasure does to your ability to believe that you deserve those dreams. Because I, I think we don't get what we want in life. We get who we are and who we are is made up of, of what we believe we deserve. And so the pleasure can be many fold. So the, as, as I was taught it, the idea is that you would go into a meditation. And this is what I teach in Sacred Secret. We go into de-exciting the nervous system. And then we remember the future, right? We remember a future that we would love. And that could be personally, it could be societally. And then from there, we have to clear the channel because oftentimes we've been repressing all of our emotions for so long. We've been trying to not feel the pain for so many decades that we become numb to even our pleasure. And it's like, good luck feeling the full potential of your ecstasy if you've been numbing all of your pain for 40 years. So the first thing we do is we clear the channel and we lean right into the shame, to the grief, to the guilt, to the fear, to the rage, to the sorrow, whatever it is that's alive. And we just let it be expressed. And what I have found over my 20 something years of doing spiritual work is that it's the simplest revelation and is that the feelings simply want to be felt. Yeah. Like that's it. They just want to be felt. They want to be heard. They want to be expressed. And then once they are, they can get their hands off the wheel. They'll just take a back seat. But if we don't let them have the microphone, they will yeah. try to take the steering wheel of your life. So that's what we do. We do something called emotional alchemy, where we actually move and dance and express whatever it is, whatever's alive for the person. And then once that channel is clear, then we start to build the creation energy. So I just simply use the term creation energy instead of sexual energy, because again, even the term sexual energy can be triggering for folks. So what we do is we start building this creation energy in the body and we start with the hoo-ha and then we build it up into the heart. And then at the moment of peak pleasure that we let that energy come up into the head. And once that body is in this open neurochemical cocktail of bliss and possibility, then we revisit that, that, that dream. We revisit the remembered future and we allow that cascade of bliss chemistry and norepinephrine and oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin while the body's in that state to revisit the dream there does a few things. One, it can increase uh, what you believe is possible, right? Like even the imaging, oftentimes people report when they do pleasure prayer with me that like their dream gets bigger. They're like, oh, I thought I wanted this, but actually it's, it's so much grander mm -hmm. or it gets more clear, but without fail, everyone says it feels more possible that their dream feels more possible after they've moved through this process. And then the last piece is that we listen. We simply listen, no agenda. We just, it's almost like a Shavasana. And it's the, I just ask the question, Hey nature, what would you have me know? Hey nature, what would you have me know? It's like, how will you let the future use you? And then we listen. Wow. That's really profound. So mm -hmm. does that mean then, I mean, that state that you're talking about, mm -hmm. You can get there also during the actual sex act. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you could absolutely do sex magic or pleasure prayer with a partner. I would say it would need to be consensual. You know, you'd want to check. I mean, it's possible to do on your own, but I think anytime you're sort of holding a whole other mental world that your partner is not aware of, it's not going to create a lot of coherence. And I think that coherence is a beautiful, important ingredient in amazing sex. So I would say if you're going to do it with a partner, I would have both people be on board. And I would say it's even more potent if both people have a shared vision. So I would recommend going into a meditation and, and sharing the dream with each other, sharing the vision, because the idea, so I think I talked about this on Aubrey's podcast, and, and I might be a bit more allegorical now, but my original download that I got was 80,000 people in a stadium climaxing at the same time, holding a shared vision for the species. And, and again, it might be an allegory, it might be real, I don't know, but even two people, right? They said that anytime even two people are together, God is present, right? And so if two people are sharing a vision, already you've doubled the size of the antenna, 
three. Uh, you could totally remake the entire concept of a global meditation. Say more. You mean with an <laughs> orgasm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're thinking about calling it the big O. <laughs> the big O. The big O. I mean, I I could see a lot of people signing up for that one. No, I mean, honestly, like on Aubrey's podcast, people still DM me. And they're like, Emily, when is the stadium happening? When is the stadium happening? Like people are ready. It I don't could know be how like a make love, not war, you know, global big O. Wait, this, that, that's a great slogan for it. Make love, not war. Because in this time of outrageous destruction, we must polarize this. We must counter this with the most creative force that we have. And we don't, we don't must do anything, but we have an opportunity, right? We have an opportunity. You know what? I think it can be the most powerful thing. I think our whole entire concept of what sexuality is, is I think purposefully by consciousness, you know, you, you said something earlier about the feelings need to be felt. Mm -hmm. And that deeply resonated within me because it made me think immediately of the Carl Jung quote about making the unconscious conscious. Mm -hmm. And until we do, right, it will basically control your life and you'll call it fate. Oof. Yes. That feels true. That feels true. And and even with as simple as a as a feeling. Uh, and so I've been doing some IFS work or internal family systems or parts work and I found that to be really liberating because if I say a part of me is angry, it's easier for me to give that part the microphone and just let it effing rage than versus saying I am angry. Because if I am angry, then I have judgment on that. I have shame on that. I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm a meditation teacher. I'm Southern. I'm a lady. Ladies don't get angry. Like all the, the cultural conditioning, men don't cry. Don't be a pussy. Don't, you know, don't like all the shame of, of crying as a man, like whatever your story is around the feeling, it's hard to feel it if you think it is you. But the parts work is so genius. Can be like, oh, there's a piece of me that's really sad. There's a part of me that's really jealous right now. And then even in communicating that, certainly relationally, you could come to your partner and say like, hey, there's a piece of me that's jealous right now that you're working so much or that you're spending so much time with a kid or that you're seeing this other lover or whatever it is. And then you just give that jealous part the microphone. It feels less accusatory. And then we can let go of some of our stories on the feelings themselves. And, and I've been found, this is, you're the perfect person to talk to about this because I have this theory that's a little half baked, but I'm so curious to know how the transition from polytheism to monotheism has changed the way that we view ourselves. Like if we had a pantheon of gods and goddesses, like most cultures have since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. you know, even in Egypt or certainly in the Vedas, there's Hanuman, right? He's a mischievous monkey or there's... Um, you know, Shiva, the god of destruction, of irrelevancy, or Lakshmi, the goddess consciousness could be inside of money, that you could see the divinity in all of these different aspects of humanity or not just of life. How does that change the way that we see ourselves versus when we go into like one God, one mind, mono mind, I am angry, I am sad. Like, how does that bifurcate us from seeing the multidimensionality of our own divinity? And so I'm curious your thoughts on that. You know, it's a very profound question you're asking because uh, on my last trip to Egypt, that was uh, actually a theme of my own intellectual and spiritual pursuit mm. because I, you know, I've been through so many temples and you start to realize that the Nile and the entire trek up the Nile, you know, towards, or it would be down from an elevation perspective towards what we call lower Egypt, which would then basically let itself out into the Mediterranean. Um, all of that is actually can be can be seen very much as the backbone of Osiris mm -hmm. and the Kundalini path and each of the temples along that journey, starting from you know the the lower parts of Abu Simbel and 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 Philae, which are all temples dedicated to Osiris in some way, shape, or form. Mm. Each one being a different chakra Isis. center. Like it's the same name. Like the Philae temples. Yeah. The and Isis, Isis and Hathor. Hathor. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh -huh. just the one divided into two. It's the same yeah. kind of concept. And, you know, even if you look at the exact location of Dendera, which is the temple of, of Hathor, right? Hathor, as it's pronounced. If you look at the exact same position of the Osirian in Abydos, it's exactly on the precisely the same, uh, you know, horizontal position on the map. 
even though it's quite a drive to get there because you've got to cross the river and it's about two hours distance, but it's in the exact same position because these are the two aspects of the heart chakra along the Nile River. So you've got Kamumbo, which is the sex chakra. It's the sacral, or I like to refer to as the vermilion. They each have musical notes that associate with them. And, and actually that particular temple in Kamumbo is, is something that you would see, you know, Sobek, which is the crocodile god. It's all over it, right? But it also represents the taming of the Kundalini life force. It represents the Ophiuchus, who is the 13th zodiacal sign in between Scorpio and Sagittarius, and, and represents also the concepts in, in Greece uh, that would be Dionysian, as well as Bacchus related in, uh, in, in Italy uh, and the Roman Empire, so in their pantheon. So the, the aspect of your question is profound. Why? Because we often see these associations between these different gods in the Egyptian pantheon, and we see it also in the Sumerian, and we see it as well in the Greek and the Roman. They're all related to the same thing, very, very closely uh, similar. And so what you find is that you have a maiden archetype. Mm -hmm. You have for the feminine aspect, the divine feminine, you have a maiden archetype, which would be Neftis. Right? This is the woman that was the sister of Isis that, that had an affair with Osiris. Right. And that was the, the subject of, you know, she gets pregnant, has the child Anubis and her husband set the brother of Osiris kills Osiris for this transgression and uh, cuts him into 14 pieces. Hmm. Right. So you've got Neftis that represents the maiden. You have Isis that represents the maid. Then you have Hator, which represents the matron. And an angry Hator becomes Sekhmet. And actually, if you look at the pantheon itself, they're all interrelated. All of these goddesses are all interrelated. And then from, from Sekhmet and Hator, you have the crone. And the crone is Nut and Mut. Nut, the mother goddess, the, the dark mother as we often refer to it in certain circles. And so is this actually just archetypal representations of us through time mm. to a certain extent, right? That each one of us represent this divine embodiment. And you could say the same thing for Osiris and Horus and Thoth. Horus is supposed to be the reincarnation of Osiris. Mm. And, and then, you know, the whole notion of, Becoming Thoth is the eye of wisdom. Is this just a representation of Thoth, basically that energy coming in, uh, obviously through all of the, the, the beautiful aspects of learning and, and knowledge? And, and actually Osiris, who is also meant to be Orion, growing up mm. and becoming an Ophiuchus eventually, when he finally gets control of his Kundalini life force, no longer needing to conquer anymore no longer having anything to prove. Well, isn't that interesting, right? If we could actually have an initiation, especially for men, right? Where they could step beyond boyhood and into manhood, therefore not having to prove that they are a man because they've been through that initiation. And if part of that were to involve this understanding of the Kundalini energy, this harnessing of this creation energy, if you could really use that, like why we wouldn't need to use destructive energy to posture power anymore. And it doesn't mean that things would never be destroyed, but we would be able to lead with creation if, if more people had an understanding of these tools. And, and I think it's fascinating to see like how deeply repressed and how much shame has been put on top of sexuality. That's why I think the Magdalene manuscripts are such a, a revelation of a book. It's a channeled text by Tom Kenyon, where, where Mary Magdalene, who was a devotee and, and arguably an avatar of Isis, was teaching Yeshua or Jesus these exact tools, like this kundalini energy, what you see in the Ankh, in the Egyptian you know, symbol of eternal life, that it's this cultivation and transmutation of sexual energy um, that, you know, arguably might have been why he was able to resurrect out of the cave, you know, and there's, there's, and if one story to me is just as believable or fantastical as the other, but if you look at those archetypes in the Vedic lore, there's um, 
Durga and Kali, right? Like Durga is the mother, the like warning mother who then if, if you know, she's like, don't you do that? Don't you put your finger in that socket? Like that's Durga who's like warning. She's loving, but she's stern. And if you put your finger in the socket, like Kali comes out, right? And then she's, it's time to destroy the irrelevance. Which, which is basically Hator mm. and Sekhmet. Mm -hmm. So I think we're answering our, our question here. It's like, obviously these, these deities are, external representations of things that are happening internal inside of humans. Like the thing I always say about the Vedas is that it is a human interpretation of natural law, right? It's, it's not a doctrine. It's not a dogma. There are no shoulds or shouldn'ts. It's just, Hey, this is our best guess as to how we think nature is working. It would behoove you to understand this natural law. If you want to use these currents to help you get to where you want to go, or you could also get bashed against the rocks, your choice just letting you know how we think nature works. And that the only reason that we anthropomorphize these entities is because it's easier to tell children about them. <laughs> well, and I, and I truly believe that it's so relevant to what's happening in the world today that, mm. um, you know, I fundamentally believe that it's not that people so much in the world, there are obviously exceptions to this, that, that the world, you know, everyone is full of, of, of a world where people hate each other. I think it's more that people hate themselves. Ugh. And when they hate themselves, that self-loathing manifests in so many dark and insidious ways. Mm. And, and we're seeing this playing out in the world, literally all over the world. And I think the reason why it's playing out is there has to be this global throat chakra activation, which has everything to do with the sex chakra. I mentioned the, the term vermilion. We are now in the stage where we're actually going all the way up to 24 chakras. 24 chakras. Like now, that level of differentiation inside of the human body. Yes. So think okay. of it the same way we think of time. Mm -hmm. So you have seven sort of white keys on a piano keyboard, mm -hmm. right? That, that would be these notes from C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then C again. The seven notes would stop at B. The eighth note would be the next octave beginning, right? Well, we have seven days in a week and we have 24 hours in a day. Each hour is one Horus. The term horology comes from Horus. Ah. Oh. And one day means one God. <laughs> right? So now you start to think about all the symbology all around it. And you start realizing that if we combined all the musical systems around the world, we wouldn't have a 12 note musical system in a scale, mm -hmm. in a chromatic scale. We would have it a 24 note scale. This would include then all the representations of pentatonic scales that exist around the world with indigenous peoples. Uh. So we would have a 24 note quarter tone scale. Now, Wait. isn't that interesting? What you just said feels like the question that I asked about what happened when we went from polytheism to monotheism to our own psyche, what happens to our ability to express emotion if we have a limited musical scale? Exactly. Whoa. So that means, and by the way, every musical interval, and this is one of the things that you know we're planning on and talking in depth about in, in Egypt, is because what I found was that the throat chakra is represented by the Giza Plateau. The throat chakra is represented how? There are three pyramids in Giza. The first is the Great Pyramid. The second is Khafre Pyramid. The third is Menkari Pyramid. The first pyramid, the Great Pyramid, represents self-awareness. It's a reflection of us. The throat chakra governs our understanding of structure of the universe. The throat chakra is also all about us speaking our truth, mainly to ourselves, first and foremost, <laughs> being able to acknowledge the issues, the repressed feelings that we haven't allowed ourselves to feel. Mm. So yes, we're going to have moments of rage. We're going to have moments of upset as we go through this catharsis, right? Yeah. We, we, we will. As we start to feel empathy for those aspects of ourselves that we shut off because it didn't benefit us in our conscious mind. Mm. And very often, you know, I, I posted this uh, video recently about this social agitator who was not necessarily the, a great guy or anything. His name is um, Saul Alinsky. And he said, our world is not a world of angels. Rather, it is a world of angles. 
a world where men speak of moral principle yet act on power principle, a world where we are always moral and our enemies, whoever they are, are always immoral. And when we finally can come to grips with this notion that everything we've been living has actually been the sum total of all the things that we believed would somehow benefit us, and we called it ethical imperative, Mm. that causes a catharsis within. Because then all the empathy that you needed to feel but didn't allow yourself to feel for all the travesties in the world that came in the wake of your conquering, in the wake of your avoidance of being able to feel it or even wanting to feel it, that your enemies actually were just human beings. That is a moment where we have a big awakening. And I think that's what's happening right now. So this is self-awareness level. The next level is self-actualization. That's represented by Caffrey Pyramid, the second pyramid. And self-actualization is still, it's manifestation and being able to get into your ability to manifest, but dependent still on time. Mm -hmm. So the degree to which you have internal, uh, either inertia, resistance, to what you wanted to experience as you just expressed this whole idea of using sex magic to be able to manifest a different reality. This is where the cafe pyramid comes in in its representation. It represents your ability to do that, but it still depends on time. And the degree to which you believe and the degree to which you know will determine the time it takes or whether your fear is stronger than your hope. If your fear is stronger than your hope, then that is what will manifest. And then the third pyramid is self-transcendence. It's when you can finally transcend duality and realize, and the ultimate duality being time itself, Mm. and realize that you are divine, that you are here to learn this expression because you had a list of a menu of items you wanted to learn through sometimes very difficult experiential learnings. Because it's not just a didactic universe. This is an experiential universe. We can't just learn it in a classroom setting. I can't only learn from someone else's mistakes. And through this process, the one divides itself into the many so that the one can experience itself through our eyes of unique perspective Mm. and build an Akashic record where each one of us has a unique ego and a unique subjective perspective so that the one can accumulate the sum of all possible subjective perspectives and learn each facet of itself through our unique eyes. There'll never be another Emily Fletcher. There'll never be another Robert Grant. There never has been an Emily Fletcher and there'll never be, there never has been another Robert Grant. There are different fractals. Yes, but they all had their own versions of their own expressions that were dependent on their own cognitive experiential biases. Mm -hmm. So my eyes, the way I see the world, no one else has seen the world this way. Mm-hmm. I used to think that, you know, doesn't everyone see the world the way I see it? And then I realized that nobody saw the world like I did. And then I started thinking, well, this is the worst thing about me is that I clearly don't see the world like everyone else does. Oh, how old and then one day I realized in full circle how old that that's my greatest that? thing. Probably 44 That you felt like that was your worst attribute is that you didn't feel the world the way the rest of the world. I went through a crisis where I finally realized I also knew that, you know, my greatest strength was also my greatest weakness. Yeah. And that's always the case. You know, any strength played to an extreme becomes a weakness in the eyes of some. Right. But I didn't realize. And so that started my own degree of self-loathing. And self-loathing is narcissism. Mm. narcissism is not falling in love with yourself. It's, it's falling in love with the way that you believe that you're projecting you and everyone else can see more than you can see. It's the nature of us. You know, a knife can't cut itself. An eye can't see itself. A fire can't burn itself. (laughs) A light cannot illuminate itself. So this becomes the real issue and challenge for us is that we cannot see ourselves in our entirety. But then finally, you come to the point where you realize that even my ego existed for a beautiful purpose. And this awakening process turns pain into purpose. 
Mm. It turns all those de- difficult negative experiences into purpose. And so to come back to your question, you know, we're going through this global throat chakra awakening where we're starting to realize finally and remember who we are. Remember our past and remember as well our futures. And each of these are musical notes. So each of the pyramids also represents an inverse equation of music. So if you take the height over Minkari pyramid, which represents self-transcendence, it represents the sound and music that we all love the most. It's what's called the major third. Mm. Da, da. And then you want to finish it with a fifth, right? Da, da, da. And then da. Then you have an octave representation. Mm -hmm. We are all going through this process. When we hear the term or when we hear the, the major third represented in music or in a movie, we immediately feel feelings of love. It entrains us to love. Mm. And the way you'd represent it is just to take the height of the pyramid over one half of its base as a proportion. And that pyramid is the major third. And its inverse is the full base over its height. And that becomes the minor sixth which is heartbreak. Mm. And the two intervals are the exact same notes. One is C to E and the other is E to C. Mm. The only difference is the time because one goes in one order of sequence and the other goes in the opposite order of sequence into a higher octave. That's it. Mm. But it's the same notes. And yet one of them makes us feel love and the other makes us feel heartbreak. There's a musical called The Last Five Years. It's written by J J Robert, um, Jason Robert Brown. And it's one of my favorite shows. It's a two-person musical. And I think they made a movie out of it, actually. And the, the man, the, it's a straight hetero couple, and the man tells the story in reverse. So he, no, no, sorry. The woman starts, tells the story in reverse. So it, it opens up and she's in like deep heartbreak, breakup anguish. And she tells the story backwards. The wow. man tells the it's story. Like a country forward. song. Yeah. So it's the same relationship, but they, they, pa they meet in the, in the same time for one song, but the rest of it is like the excitement and enthusiasm and passion yeah, of a beautiful. new relationship. And the other is the heartbreak of it ending. And it is one of the most poignant, beautiful musicals, but it reminds me of exactly this same notes, same events, but told in a different sequence has a very different emotional effect on the body. It's amazing, right? So when you think about this universe, if I look at that pyramid from one perspective, it's height over its one half base, it's love. And when mm -hmm. I look at it from its opposite inverted perspective, it's base over its height, it's heartbreak. Mm. So in the experience of love is the seed of heartbreak. Isn't that profound? Yeah. So it's the contrast that allows for this universe to have the beauty of the experience. Yeah. And you could even extrapolate that all the way into like a, a, a BDSM or something like where it's like, oh, it's actually the cessation of pain that creates this outrageous pleasure, right? That it is that it. If, and without that, and even inside of the sacred secret formula, right? Like I won't even let people touch the ecstasy until we first clear the channel and lean right into that sacred rage, those protector parts and those vulnerable, that sacred sorrow. We need so a safe it, word. It, what's that? We need a safe word. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Bananas. <laughs> Bananas. <laughs> Like minions, like minions, they love bananas, right? That's the whole thing about yeah. those minion cartoon things. They love bananas. <laughs> bananas. Okay, that's funny. Um, <laughs> synchronicity, amazing synchronicity. I was just thinking about that yesterday. But the, the, the point that I think you're making and the question you have about this pantheon of the gods, we have separated ourselves up into all of these experiences. I watched a movie last night called Predestined. Mm. I'd never seen it before. It had Ethan Hawke in it. And it was a trippy movie through time where you realize that there's only really one character playing different people that you think are all different, but they're all actually the same through time. It's the most bizarre movie. You got to see it. But it really mm -hmm. illustrated this point that each and every one of us is the one divided. 
And everyone around us in this world around us is our one over X representation, right? That's split into all of these different reflections, allowing us to observe ourselves through unique eyes. Mm. And, and I believe as well that the doorway to that is through sacred sexuality. Mm. Because it is the physical representation, right? Like it, again, the two become not even one, it actually becomes a third thing, but there is this unification that happens. And it's, it's so fascinating. I had this idea. It was in the full moon. I did a bit of a ceremony with myself and I don't, again, this is a little half-baked because it's only two days old, but I feel like you're the perfect person to share my half-baked ideas with and you can either Go verify or deny. Um, but I was thinking about the different lineages and, and basically the disciplines that I have found myself so drawn to, right? which is meditation, pleasure, and medicine. These are the, the modalities that have allowed me to remember my own divinity and that have allowed me to help other people remember that there is only one thing. And, the, they're, they're, and that is the foundation of the Vedas, that there's only one thing and that one thing is consciousness. There's only one thing we're all it. And that one thing is consciousness. And so what I'm, the modalities I'm into as of late meditation, pleasure, and medicine. And so the idea being that this duality, this, this piece we're talking about, the polarity, that the inability to go to the light without first going to the dark, um, with Vipassana, right? Like, have you ever done Vipassana, like a 10 day silent meditation retreat? I have not, but I've had several friends that have done it and, um, and I've considered doing it, but I have not done it yet. Well, I think I've only done one, but the thing that was fascinating and surprising to me about it is that about for the first 45 minutes, I was like, certainly they can see what a good meditator I am. Like, certainly they can see I'm such a, <laughs> I was like on the front row of this being a great student. And then a minute 46, I was like, certainly I'm going to have to amputate my legs. I'll never be able to walk again. What if I need to go back to Broadway? Like excruciating, searing physical pain <laughs> wow. from minute 46. And I had eight and a half hours left to go just that day for 10 days, excruciating physical pain. And for the first time I understood BDSM, I was like, oh, the pain and pleasure centers are very close inside of the brain. And by about day six, I stopped avoiding the pain. I stopped trying to get out of it. About a day four, the teacher calls me over. He's not supposed to be talking either. And he said, I had like, I was like a princess in the pee. I had so many pillows under me and I was trying to avoid the pain. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid the discomfort. And he calls me over and he goes, hey, wow stop trying to not be miserable. And I was like, oh, I got it. And I just sat in the pain and I just let the pain be. I just felt the pain. Now, now when you're in Vipassana, do you, do you say something back or do you just kind of like telepath? No, I just, I just nodded. I just, <laughs> I just, you gave a little prayer hands. <laughs> Um, but it did it, like the message came through because I was, it was in me trying to not be miserable that I was, it was the, it was the avoiding of the pain that was disallowing me from actually getting to the breakthrough. And then once I sat in the pain, my consciousness expanded to yeah. get bigger. And then I had these waves of what felt like 24 hour a day orgasmic bliss that wasn't even sexual. It was just that, that, that state of consciousness that we're in an orgasm where we transcend the self, right? In French, it's the, the petite mort, the little death. So again, we're coming back to that dying so in so in vipassana right you have this extreme physical pain that leads to this extreme awakening in medicine ceremonies right it's like for almost all medicines there's some sort of an ego death right in ayahuasca there's a purge in bufo there's a total dissolution um you know in mushrooms there can be just uncomfortability but there's some sort of a portal that usually mm. you have to walk through to get to some new understanding and then in, in pleasure, it's the same. It's, the, it's it, to its extreme in BDSM. If you're using pain, it's the cessation of pain that leads to such extreme pleasure. And I just thought it was fascinating that these three very different spiritual modalities have that in common. It was like this extreme polarity. And yet if we dance inside of that polarity, then we stop polarizing the planet. It's like, can we mm. polarize ourselves so that we stop polarizing the planet? That's like Ralph Smart doing the, can I get a hello? Ooh, right? <laughs> I don't you know, know that, that. I like it though. He's, he's hilarious. You got to watch him. I've been watching him since I was like, I don't know, it's probably 10 plus years now. He, his name's Ralph Smart and he does this whenever someone says something really impactful like this, like, can I get a hello? Can uh, I, yes, hello. <laughs> that definitely resonates. And you just made me figure something out. Yes. That I... I just got a download regarding, 
Oh, Orion, you know, Orion was also Osiris. It's the same constellation. Mm-hmm. Orion uh, was, there are many ways in the Greek mythology of how Orion dies, right? He, he's like the groundhog day of death, right? He dies several different ways. One way is he gets killed by his lover, right? Appropriate. Um, who was the huntress Artemis, and she shoots him with an arrow by accident because Apollo, her brother, is jealous of their relationship. Hmm. And so Apollo says, I bet you're not such a good archer that you could hit that little target way off in the distance. And she didn't realize it was Orion swimming in the ocean. And so she kills Orion, her lover, and Zeus gives him a constellation. Well, in another story, Orion ends up getting killed by a scorpion. Now, this is deep because, you know, even going back to the Bible in Genesis where, you know, God comes to Adam and says, Adam, you know, where art thou? And he says, he says, oh, I was hiding because I was naked and I was ashamed. Right. So he covered himself with fig leaves and he said, who told you that you were naked? And he said, oh, the woman that you gave me and commanded I should remain with her. She gave me the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and I did eat. Eve, what hast thou done? Oh, uh, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So the first emotion we learn about from Adam is shame. The second thing we learn is that as soon as you feel ashamed, you cast blame on someone else. And so then God curses the snake, and he says, you know, you will have the power to bruise his heel, but he shall have power to crush thy head, the seed of the woman. Right, that was the whole th- concept. Now, what's interesting about this is that the scorpion and the snake are are syncretized in the zodiac of 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 Scorpio. What's so Scorpio mean? syncretized means they've been brought together, like amalgamated, right into okay. one. So Scorpio is the one sign in the zodiac that actually goes through this transformative process, where it goes from being a a snake or a scorpion, right to an eagle, and then eventually a phoenix. Mm -hmm. It gets redeemed, right? And that's through the whole Kundalini awakening process, that Scorpio is redeemed. Scorpio is associated with Lucifer. Scorpio is like the evil aspect of the shadow. So the shadow of the Zodiac, right, for Orion, because Orion is right next to the plane of the ecliptic, just slightly below it. The shadow of him would be, you know, for Taurus, because he's right next to Taurus, is Scorpio. Scorpio is a shadow. So in the story, the scorpion stings his heel, right? Stings his heel and kills him. I actually believe, and I'm not going to be the first to try this out, uh, that, that there is actually some benefit like Bufo mm-hmm. within scorpions mm-hmm. at some micro dose level. I'm not encouraging mm-hmm. anyone to try this at home. Okay. Nobody you know tried what's funny is that when you were talking about the crocodile, when you were talking about the temple of the crocodile, the first thought I had was I bet there's some sort of a venom elixir secretion that perhaps is similar to Bufo because that reptilian brain, 200 million years, these reptiles uh-huh. have been on the planet long before humans. So what do we have to learn from that reptilian consciousness? And so again, it was just a theory. I don't there's know. Gonna be, there's going to be a whole new industry that spawns off of this podcast probably. Of like, you <laughs> reptilian know, scorpion extraction. Death, right? Scorpion death or crocodile death or whatever, you know? And <laughs> Yeah, no, no joke. So don't don't anyone just try this at home. But yeah, but because it has this neurotoxin in it, in- mm-hmm. I bet, and it's a biologic, I bet that there's probably some healing benefit of it. Now, the way that Orion gets saved because he's he's supposed to have died is Asclepius, who is also Ophiuchus who's actually directly opposite from Orion in the night sky Mm. on the Zodiac. Ophiuchus is Asclepius who has the rod and he has control over the snake. Now it represents two aspects. One is that he's been healed by the rod, the staff, right? And the snake, which represents the the rod of Asclepius or often the, the symbology of the staff of Hermes. But in addition to that, I realized that the reference here was not necessarily to Orion's actual physical death, but to his ego death. Mm. 
And that when you look at the Zodiac, just below the plane of the ecliptic is Orion. Its opposite is Ophiuchus, who is Asclepius. And he's just above the plane of the ecliptic. When you look at them in totality, the conscious mind and the subconscious, the, 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 the hero, right? And or a villain or a shadow. They actually have to be seen as equals. And then when you do, they both end up on the claim of the eclipse on the on the plane of the ecliptic. So maybe we're actually missing some true zodiac signs, right? Not just the 13th, but maybe even a 14th. Mm, because that they would all have some sort of counter or some sort of polar that they have a polar relationship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That there is no hero without the villain. There <laughs> is no light without the darkness. Yeah. And that we create, just by being the hero, we create the villain unknowingly. Because one is there to understand its boundary condition from the other. And that that is part of how consciousness separates itself into conscious and subconscious mind. And into all this pantheon of gods. It's a fascinating exploration. Mm. And, and again, I don't recommend anyone to try, you know, Scorpion Bufo or whatever it's going to be now. <laughs> um, but I do feel that there's some truth to this concept of metaphor. I think so too. Or even if it wasn't a literal extraction, like any wound, any sting, any pain, like that can be the way into the healing. It can be, you know, the pain carves out space for more joy. The wound really felt, really observed, knowing that on some degree my soul chose this so that I could learn from it. So what is here to learn? Like all of that can be the medicine, even if there isn't some sort of neurotoxic, you know, benefit from it. But um, yeah, this is exciting, exciting. And this is what you're this. saying about Vipassana then, that you experience the pain mm. and that that experience of pain, you said you did, you, 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 you did Bufo also, which is also many mm -hmm. would say, you know, that's quite an ordeal. Mm -hmm. um, but people often um, attest that after they've had Bufo and after they've gone through Vipassana, that they are able to experience higher degrees of ecstasy. One million percent. It, so for in the Vipassana, it was it was not so much the pain as learning not to avoid the pain. Right. I think had I learned that on day two, it would have just been, you know, eight days of orgasmic bliss. <laughs> but it took me a little while. I was a little slow on the uptake. This is a long time ago, it was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. But it, it it was then not avoiding the pain. But then the trick is you start chasing the ecstasy. Right. You're like, oh, how it hurts so bad. I want to get out. And the trying to get out keeps you from that. When you actually sit in it and let the pain envelop you, then the consciousness pulls up then you can see that I am not just this pain. I am bigger than this body. The, it's like the brain has to do it as a survival mechanism. And then once the lens gets pulled back, your lens of perception gets wider, then there's space for this joy that is beyond the individuality, that sort of orgasmic bliss where we do transcend time and space, where we are not our bodies, we just are. The same thing that happens in meditation, right? I am not Emily Fletcher, founder of Ziva Meditation, when I am in meditation, I just am. So same thing happens in sex, same thing happens in, in meditation, I mean, in medicine, right? Where, so the thing that with the realization was is that even though these paths are so disparate, seemingly disparate, they're actually taking us to the same place, obviously, because there is only one thing and we are all it. And that one thing is consciousness. But what was fascinating was uh, the realization that I just had was this duality, this polarity inside of these three seemingly disparate lineages um, that, that I guess it is the death, right? You have to die before you die in order to really live. Whoa. So that's fascinating on so many mm -hmm. levels as I think about the alchemical process and the philosopher's stone and transmuting lead into gold. Mm. Because what it makes me think of is that the pain and all of the the difficult experiences that we have is actually the alchemy that creates the bliss and ecstasy 
it creates the backdrop for the bliss and ecstasy to be experienced. Yes, this is it. My first retreat I ever hosted, I called it the sexual alchemy retreat because it was exactly this. It was like, can we take this raw material? Can we take whatever is? And if it's numbness, great, let's deal, let's, let's dance with the numbness. If it's shame, beautiful, let's accept and feel this shame fully. If it's fear, beautiful. Can we love this fear? Like, so whatever it is, can we love what is, can we allow that thing to be expressed? Because we know that on the other side of that is spaciousness and nature does not like a vacuum, right? So once you have that spaciousness and you're in a ceremony space where the intention is either to put the attention on the prayer or healing, right? Then it's like, then that vacuum of, of that clear channel gets filled intentionally. And that is something I've, I found so, so beautiful. Um, yeah, the alchemical process is infinitely, infinitely fascinating. And I think it's all we're really ever doing. And I have this theory that because we as a society do not individually know how to feel our pain, we do not know how to turn our lead into gold, that it has made us not want to look at our, our human waste. Like just because I, I don't know what to do with my rage, my fear, my sadness. I don't want to look at these darker, right. deeper emotions. So same, I don't want to look at all of the waste that I'm producing on the planet. And I have this theory that if we got better at recycling, not even recycling, but composting our emotions, like taking that shit and turning it into fertile soil, would that change the way that we as a species interact with our waste that we are producing? And we're like, oh, I just don't want to look at that. We'll just send it to China. We'll just send it out to the middle of the ocean. But again, there is no away. There is just the earth and the ocean. <laughs> so that stuff isn't going anywhere. And eventually we will be swimming in it. And we're seeing that happening emotionally right now. We already had a mental health crisis, right? And then the pandemic sort of poured gasoline on top of that mental health crisis. And now we're seeing this extreme fight, flight, or freeze. We're seeing these extreme incarnations of that. And this is really just a byproduct of us, of intergenerational trauma, right? That we haven't known how to heal. We don't know how to write the new story just yet. And so there's a lot of themes here. I know I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but, but big picture, it's this idea of if we individually were better at alchemizing our shit into yeah. fertile soil, yeah. what would happen as a species with our actual physical waste? I totally agree. And we'd stop projecting it onto the world around us too. Yeah. That's mm. what I believe. And I started by saying that I felt there was a deep connection between the throat chakra and the sex chakra. There is, right? The... The sex chakra is ruled by Scorpio, as we know it, the sacral chakra, whereas mm. the, the throat chakra is ruled by Taurus. Those are two opposites of each other on the zodiac, mm. exactly 180 degree opposites of each other, six months apart. Mm. And it's the same concept of the scorpion rising, right? The sex chakra rising up through the Kundalini. And when the two meet together, they actually meet at the pineal gland and the pituitary gland. So often we talk about the third eye and we talk about the Ajna chakra or we talk about uh, the crown chakra and we talk, talk of them as separate. Actually, they're totally combined. They, mm -hmm. they meet together because the pineal gland- You think the throat and the, and the third eye? For the throat, the throat mm -hmm. is the bridge between the heart that connects the heart to the, to the brain, right? Mm -hmm. And at the, at the center in the thalamus or what's called the cave of Brahman, Mm -hmm. You have you have a pineal gland, which is shaped like a penis. And you have a pituitary gland, which is shaped like a um, uh, it's, it's basically an equilateral triangular shape, but it also has mm -hmm. the shape of what looks like a vagina. Mm -hmm. So the two can be brought into the same plane, but the feminine must rise inside the brain to make those two aspects of your physicality mate. And have sex. Mm. So this is the Ida and the Pingala, right? Yes. Meet together. The two snakes. You, you can the two snakes. You can bring your mm -hmm. brain into the same level as the pineal gland or the pituitary gland. You have to do it with intention and attention. And as you breathe, as we breathe, our heart contracts, you know, from its beating, but so does our brain. Mm. Our brain also moves up and down. And the front of it, when we take in a breath, you can actually raise your pituitary so that it can touch your pineal gland electrically. Mm. And you have a male female interaction that becomes a crown chakra activation. I can feel that right now. It's happening in my body. 
<laughs> and, and in the Magdalene manuscripts, there's a technique there where you take those two snakes, one, one black, one gold, and you just imagine that energy coursing up through your body, mm -hmm. crossing at the different energy centers. And then you imagine those two snakes secreting a serum into the chalice. Right. So yeah. it's like both glands are secreting this precursor mm -hmm. to DMT mm -hmm. into the chalice. And, um, and, and this can happen at the moment of peak pleasure, at the moment of orgasm and create really, really heightened states. And, you know, Joe Dispenza is playing with this at his workshops. When you go, I mean, it's, it's like the least sexy thing ever, you know, but he sort of sucked the sex out of it. But he is very much using this technology of like having people bring energy up into the pineal and pituitary gland. And it's fascinating because people are actually going into orgasmic states, but they don't even know it. Like they're going into full gamma states, screaming, fainting. But if you were to interview them, they would not say that they had just had an orgasm. Um, similar, to, I think, to Vipassana, where I was in this sort of 24-hour day rolling orgasmic state, but it didn't necessarily feel sexually pleasurable. But there was a similar bigness to it and a transcendence to it. Um, so I did not know, though, about the pineal and the pituitary being like this male and female relationship. That feels very exciting to explore. And, and actually what it does is it enlightens or it turns on the optic chiasm. So What's the optic that? chiasm, it sounds like an orgasm. Right? It sure does. <laughs> so your left eye connects to your right brain. You've probably mm -hmm. seen that. And your mm -hmm. right eye connects to your left brain. And they connect to the occipital lobe through the optic nerve. The optic nerve comes out of the back of your eyeball, right? And it, it takes all the information from your eye, from your retinal receptors, and takes it all in. And then your right eye connects to your left brain, and your left eye connects to your right brain. And they basically come to the back of your brain, right in the occipital lobe. Mm. Well, the chiasm is basically like the Greek letter chi or he, which is the X. It's shaped like an X even. Mm. So the left brain is the linear thinking. The right brain is the curvilinear thinking. If you're right-handed, right? It's opposite if you're left-handed. But your, your right brain is the seat of music and creativity. It's the seat of artistic expression. It's the seat of the irrational mind. It's the seat of the curve. Intuition. And then the left brain, intuition, absolutely. The left brain is the opposite of all of those things, the rational mind. Where you had music on the right brain, you have mathematics on the left. Where you have uh, artistic expression on the right brain, you have natural sciences on the left. So you could see that we have mirror neurons that are connecting all of this. And the, the tissue that connects those two hemispheres of the brain is called the corpus callosum. It allows us to think and feel at the same time. Now, generally, women are much better at this than men, right? <laughs> when men fall in love, we lose it. We, we can't really think about anything else. And then when we're not in that moment of being flooded with oxytocin, we end up being very left brain oriented in general, right? That's because mm -hmm. we have to kill the woolly mammoth or something. It's kind of like the hunter gatherer concept. And so mm -hmm. we get ruled by the left aspect of our brain, the rational seat. But when we finally get to this ascended control over our Kundalini and we have a partner, right? Which I would say is the, the personification of the alchemical union, the alchemical mm -hmm. union in sex magic partnership is the most powerful thing that we can do here on this earthly plane to realize divinity and our own divinity. Yeah. And when we bring that together, you can actually transcend this physical plane of reality. It has been my experience that you can actually go to an entirely different realm and world mm -hmm. that often is referred to in Buddhism or in Hinduism as uh, experiencing a new reality akin to Shambhala, mm -hmm. a whole other world that you can go into together. You'll see a spinning Merkaba at the center of your brain. It starts off as a black cube. And as you direct your consciousness to it, it's like going into an elevator when you put yourself into that black cube. You realize that it turns to crystal, and now you have a knob on your staff of Hermes, which is basically what I would refer to as the Kalindra stone. Kalindra is time. Kali, dragon. The Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail. And this enters you into a new experience of Leela in your life. 
a realization that you're in a simulation of your own making, that it can be very, very beautiful. Even the difficult, harsh experiences are here for our better learning or our higher purpose, that lead can be transmuted into gold by the realization of the divine aspect of who we are. And this to me is, is what I believe is the alchemical path of a journey towards enlightenment. And I wanted to hear what your thoughts are on, on all of this, if it makes any sense to you whatsoever. Yeah, or it's if it what I've been completely not. <clears throat> no, it sounds like exactly the thing that is lighting me up. It sounds like a thing I can't get enough of. And I've been researching and exploring both viscerally and tangibly and also intellectually. And, and it's to me, it's like a whole other world, a whole other universe of possibility that's fascinating that it's just been hiding in plain sight, you know, and then it becomes this real question of how on earth did we allow ourselves to forget? How on earth did we allow this tens of thousands of year, like, I guess, opposite of magic trick occur where we, where we real, where we forgot that the kingdom of heaven is within, that I can actually change my relationship with time. I can change my relationship with reality. I can change reality with this internal cocktail of neurochemistry that nature has gifted me, right? Like God, if you want to use the G word, has installed us with these capabilities and with these neurotransmitters and the ability to experience all of it. And yet many of us have allowed ourselves to think that it's a sin or bad or wrong or shameful. And to me, this is like the whole power of Tantra, right? Even Tantra outside of any sort of sexuality is the reclamation of energy that has been put away, right? Like if, if there's, there's power in something that has been compartmentalized. And so, you know, death, there can be huge amounts of tantric energy inside of death. If we never look at death, there can be an extraordinary reclamation from sex if we have compartmentalized our sexual energy. But everything you're saying sounds like exactly right on and spot on and, and, and just a beautiful, for me, beautiful to have more language and more exact geometry around a phenomenon that is a bit more abstract and a bit more intuitive in my experience thus far. Well, it's, it's, it can be an incredibly beautiful thing. And a couple of things happen. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised if you notice that the soft spot at the top of your head becomes even softer. Mm. There's a hole at the top of your head. It's called mm -hmm. the, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Brahmanandra. And it's a hole that comes out where the lotus flower comes out of your head and expands mm -hmm. your auric field. This is something that comes in. And I, when I first experienced it, I got up in the middle of the night. I felt like a bloody nose. You know that feeling you get right before you get a bloody nose? Mm -hmm. I felt like blood rushing down my brain. I heard a pop. It was like a popping sound in my sleep after I had experienced this kind of tantric experience and I felt blood rushing down my brain and immediately after I had a bad, bad, bloody nose. Wow. Yeah. It's a thing. It's a real and this thing. This was like your, your pineal gland or, or what no, do you this think? Is the, so what happens is the pressure after you've experienced this pineal pituitary gland lovemaking, right? And you mm -hmm. do it with a partner as well. They experience the exact same thing. You can actually go into a different world and experience a different time space reality. Mm. Yeah, Jamie Wheel calls this the, the cosmic fuck tunnel. <laughs> That's not a bad name. <laughs> That's definitely yeah. not a bad name. But basically what happens is um, this pressure builds up within a day or two after you're experiencing this for the first time. This pressure builds up and it's almost like you've got a hymen at the top of your head, mm. right? And it pops and then it opens up a hole so that, and so if, when, when I see you, I'll let you feel my head. I've got a literal hole in the top of my head. Amazing. It's a thing. Look it up. Cool. Look Great. it up. I love this. This will be like our new spiritual ego. This is how we can like, you know, make sure to see who's better than who in the spiritual realm. Yeah. <laughs> You're so into spiritual hierarchy. But like, is your is your crown chakra even soft? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a, do you have a hole in your head now? Um, and and basically, it's like your your aura and your life force energy comes out 
out of the top of your head mm. and it goes into this double torus field, right? It comes into yeah. your solar plexus. So the I crown think. chakra represents future, right? The heart represents now. And and the uh, the solar plexus represents the past. Mm. So we're holding on to this unfelt emotion right, that needed to be felt, and it's being held into our solar plexus. And as we start to transmute that energy, we start to feel the empathy that we avoided ourselves, didn't allow ourselves to feel. Then you start to transmute and turn this lead of your past experience into gold. Mm. Right? It was Steve Jobs who said that, you know, you can't see how the dots in your life connect until you can see them fully in a retrospective way. And I, I fully have experienced that as well. So not only do you have that, but another remnant that's left from this is you have something called a ring cell stone that starts to form in your heart. Mm. A ring cell stone, I went to uh, meet with Dalai Lama in 2019 uh, after I, I went, discovered the prime number. I went last year, I got to go to um, Dharamshala. And yes, I went to Dharamshala. It's an amazing experience, right? And I, yeah. I went there to teach him math and physics with the. With oh, that's Rupert. right. You had a council with him to talk about the the music of emotion. Is that right, or something different? Well, I talked to him specifically about uh, the prime number pattern because when uh, there's a pattern and something's not supposed to have a pattern, it sort of implies a creator, mm. right? And mm -hmm. so he wanted to understand it. He loves physics. He's totally into it. So I spent five mm -hmm. hours with him with a group of six other scientists that I led a delegation to meet with him on it. And we had physicists and biologists and, 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 uh, and nuclear physicists and mathematicians on this trip. And it was a great trek, right? But you notice when you go there, did you see that there were these little bowls that have these beads in them? Mm. Right. If you walk mm -hmm. around the palace, they have these little bowls with beads. So I asked what these beads were, and they said, oh, these are ring cell stones. And I said, what are ring cell stones? They said, this is the remains uh, of uh, the crystallized remains of the ashes of high lamas after they've wow. been cremated. And I said, what does that mean? They said, well, after we cremate a high lama, we can see how many of these crystals are left. We pick up the crystals. They look like amber stones. We pick them up and we know how the level of purity that that Lama had achieved in their lifetime. So maybe this is where the term weighing of the heart comes from. So this, wow. these crystals are formed, they come out in these little bowls. And so I said, wait a minute. So there's a crystal that forms in the heart. He said, yes. So I looked it up and sure enough, Joan of Arc, when she was burned at the stake, there was a large crystal that was left in the place of her heart and someone threw it in the river. They didn't know what it was. So they tossed it in the river. And the degree to which you've achieved a higher level of purification in your lifetime mm -hmm. will determine the size of this ring cell stone. Well, it's not only in your heart that one of these stones forms. When you have this experience of full Kundalini awakening, you have a similar stone that is um, uh, basically, it, it, it's, uh, there's, there's two stones that will form. One that's going to be the amber stone that's going to be in the heart, right? The other one is going to be in the solar plexus once you start to transmute the past. So you'll actually have a, a stone that forms in your solar plexus area as well. It's mm -hmm. crystal. And then you have another crystal that forms in the hypothalamus that becomes mm -hmm. the, the, the top of the, the staff of Hermes, mm -hmm. right? And this is what I was calling this calendar stone. It looks like Jupiter. Literally, it looks like Jupiter, right? So mm -hmm. you've probably seen, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the stone right now, but it's like a cat's eye, but it's not a cat's eye. Um, I'll remember it in, in just a little bit. But, but basically, it's a type of stone that forms at the top after you've had this union of both sides. And yeah. when you're burned, those stones will be left in your ashes. Be interesting to go to Varanasi, right? Because Varanasi is where the funeral pyres are in in India, and apparently, you know, the the legend is that if you if your body is burned in Varanasi, then you transcend the cycle of death and rebirth. So even people who aren't who didn't die there will have their body sent to Varanasi. But there's, you know, it would, I would be on the boats in the Ganges outside of these giant funeral pyres, and it'd be so interesting to see like if any crystals are there, and and what happens if the body's not burned? Then the, then we don't know. 
Well, then you'd, I guess you'd find it if you did some sort of, a, you know, an autopsy on autopsy. them. Autopsy. Okay. But, so uh, it's not but, the fire that is making it. That, that process is the crystals already being no, formed. No, it's not the firing the of it. They've already, uh-huh. they already exist. Wow. And so this is what, this is what, you know, Buddhists um, believe. And there's mm-hmm. a lot you can learn about these ring cell stones. It's R-I-N-G-S-E-L, ring cell stones. Ring if you cell look stones. it up, yeah. if you look it up, you'll find it. But what comes from sex alchemy is the one that forms both at the top or at the hypothalamus in the wedding hall, as it's referred to. Mm-hmm. The wedding hall or the cave of Brahman, and also in the solar plexus. Wow. So you have three this... stones. So these this... crystals, have you heard this before? No, I've never heard of this before. So exciting. Well, I thought if I was going to talk with anyone about it, it would be you because <laughs> you're this, you know, preeminent wisdom teacher on and willing to address these taboo subjects. Mm. Um, I did a whole, if you want to talk about this or see this with slides, you can see my, my series on Gaia called Divine Encryption. Okay. And it's yeah. on Gaia Plus. It's like 16 hours of lecture, but you can find the wow. section on just sex magic. And so what feels fascinating to me about this is, is yes, like using it as a way to manifest and to magnetize and to create our reality, but also like my personal practice as of late is, can I use my own masculine energy to hold my own feminine? So this divine union is happening inside of me because I've always had a lot of masculine energy and why I've been successful in this sort of masculine world, but as the paradigm on the planet is shifting to one of more feminine, it feels like an opportunity to like hold myself and and create. So the fact that this is happening, that there's this pituitary and pineal, like male and female marriage happening in the brain feels so perfectly right on schedule to what's happening in my personal spiritual practice right now. That feels exciting. Well, everything happens for a reason, Mm -hmm. right? Everything at the future determines the past as much as the past determines the future. Well, have you ever heard of a Rashi? It's like this huge surge in consciousness. It's a Sanskrit term, Rashi. No, I haven't. You'll love this concept. It's the idea that, it, that as we up-level our consciousness in the now, we change the lens through which we see our past. And if you change the lens through which you see the past, the you past changes. change the past, right? Yes. And so that up-levels the, the past, like even trauma, right? Like, oh, I was raped when I was seven. And it's like, okay, well, if that has led you to this beautiful path of enlightenment and you are happy with who you are now and you love who you are now, then you will see even something as heinous as rape through the lens of gratitude. And if you put that on that incident, it will change the frequency of yourself in that moment, which then changes and up levels your state of consciousness in the now, which then obviously up levels your state of consciousness in the future. And then as the future you consciousness increases, that goes back onto present you. And so this phenomenon is happening sort of in an infinity loop until there is this Rashi moment where the past and the future meet in the present moment. And there's this huge surge in consciousness. And this might be, you know, perhaps a Kundalini awakening, but oftentimes it's separate from these alchemical practices that we've been talking about. This is like where you're manipulating the energy or breath or visualizing something and creating that alchemical process. This is more... It, it, it is a gradual process until it is not, right? It's gradual and over time until these two things meet. And then there's like this tsunami of, of consciousness yeah. that happens. I just remembered the name of the crystal in the, in the brain is the tiger's okay. eye. Oh, okay. Yeah, so eye. You said cat's eye, but yeah, tiger's mm-hmm. eye. I love cat's that. Eye is, eye. Cat's eye is the one. Cat's eye is the one in the solar plexus. The one that's inside the brain is tiger's eye. Okay. And it looks literally like a little Jupiter. And, I wonder why, and, it's, it's it's why you always see the gurus sitting on tiger skin rugs. I wonder if there's something there. Maybe I, I maybe that's some sort of representation of of having achieved that level mm-hmm. of uh, of awakening and transcendence. But mm-hmm. you know, another categorically important aspect of this is the realization of the anima and animus. So the anima and animus in in the work of Carl Jung. Right. We just talked about until you make your unconscious conscious, it will continue to control your life and you'll call it fate. Mm-hmm. At a certain level, we create our. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. We create our personas of our conscious mm-hmm. mind in moments of vulnerability, just like Adam felt naked 
vulnerable, so he had to cover himself. And then he felt shame and he had to blame someone else. So as soon as we feel vulnerability, we want to hide that vulnerability and not allow anyone to see it. But even those feelings must be felt, mm. right? That's the thing. It's the repressed feelings that we don't feel that cause us all of the weird experiences in life that ultimately when we can look at them through the lens that you just said, right? Then that is turning lead into gold because I've had many experiences that at the moment I was experiencing, I was like, this is the worst experience I've ever experienced. That then within only a few months, sometimes only a few years, I turned around entirely my perception of that moment and said, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. Well, this comes back to the concept we were saying in the beginning. It's like your willingness to die to who you are. It's like your willingness, because even the fear of the shame, the fear of the fear, the fear of the pain is to some degree a fear of death, right? That like, oh, the shame is so big. It's so overwhelming. It might destroy me. It might destroy my identity of who I think that I think I'm a good person and I have shame about this thing that I did. And if I really lean into it, it will destroy that identity of who I think that I am. But in so doing, if you can bring love, to whatever that thing is, then that is the alchemical force, right? Then we get to integrate that trauma and it gets to expand as it becomes like a, like a video game where we eat the mushroom and we get bigger. Like now when I discover my trauma, I get excited because I'm like, oh great, here's this thing that's been sucking my energy, sucking my power. And if I can just feel it and love it, it will make me stronger. It will give me superpowers, but not until, like you said, we can make the unconscious conscious. Elizabeth Gilbert talks about this in a beautiful way where she says that her fear, she lets it She's like, she acknowledges her fear. She loves her fear and she lets it come along for the ride, but she makes it sit in the back seat, right? She's like, you can sit in the back seat. You're not allowed to touch the steering wheel. You're not allowed to touch the radio. You're not allowed to touch the map, but you're with me on this ride in the back seat. But I think it's when we try and keep that fear out of the car, that's when they hijack it. That's when they're like, get over and they take the wheel. Well, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about this concept last night. Superpowers were never meant to be free. Ooh, say more. Superpowers were never meant to be free. That means that until we learn to transmute our perception through higher perspective, to realize that our suffering and difficulty is actually the vehicle through which we achieve the embodiment of those superpowers, mm -hmm. you have to realize that all of it, had. there was a price to be paid. The price was to go through the pain and the difficulty in order to then learn to transmute it. Now, it's like learning math. <laughs> math, a lot of people hate learning math. That's because they learn math without meaning. Oof. If we learn math yeah. with its true spiritual meaning, what it truly is as a language of God, then every moment that we hated mathematics could be transcended into a moment of God realization that yeah. is then turning all of the pain of learning math in junior high school into purpose. Yes. Because now we realize that, that math with meaning is very different than math without meaning. Math with meaning is divine communication. Math without meaning is just information. Mm. And then something you're being tested on to see if you're good or bad, or if you're worthy of love or not. But what you said earlier about That's the superpower right. that meaning to be free, like I, I, I just want to say this out loud is that let, can, may this be our prayer for what is happening right now. Like all of this pain, all of this suffering, all of this divisiveness, like can those of us who are searching for meaning, those of us who are wanting to alchemize, those of us who are willing to die into of this version of who we are and step into some new reality to birth this more beautiful earth that our hearts know is possible, may the intensity of this particular flavor of suffering really lead to extraordinary superpowers beyond our level of cognition right now. And, and what manifests through that prayer is we will then experience our anima in the case of a man, right? He will have a feminine form or feminine energetic that will come into his life. In the case of a woman, she may have a masculine form, it may not necessarily be of another of the opposite gender, but there will be a transference of, of complementarity of energy. And when that comes into your life, some refer to it as a twin flame union. I refer to it as an alchemical union hmm. that they really are the other side of you. All the aspects of yourself that you 
did not accept in yourself. The things that you would never have thought you would be attracted to will be embodied in a human being. <laughs> that you will be intractably attracted to. That there is no way that you can escape that degree of attraction. And I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on Twin Flame Union because this is a fundamental aspect of God realization. And experiencing all of these higher states of consciousness that I'm speaking of, it's such a fun, because it's literally about learning to fall in love with yourself. I mean, to me, that's the whole game. That's why we've incarnated. And every play that we go see, every sports game that we watch, every love affair that we have, every meal that we eat, that, that is the game. We're falling in love with ourselves through this appearance of separateness. And I always argue that it's not an illusion. Like that separateness is real. Like you, you are really not in New York City and I am really not in California. Like we are two separate bodies. That is real. So it's not an illusion of separateness, but it's an appearance of separateness, meaning that the wave sometimes appears separate from the ocean, but it's never really separate from the ocean. And so to me, like the whole game of why we incarnated, you know, just to bring it back to this quote, is it's, it's the joy of becoming one again. It's because it's fun to fall in love with ourselves through the appearance of someone who appears separate. It's, it's fun to see ourselves inside of a protagonist of a great, amazing movie. Last night I was watching Harry Potter with my five-year-old son. And, <laughs> and he said at the end, he said, I love Harry. And he doesn't really throw around the L word too much. Like he's, he's pretty sparing with his love. <laughs> and, and just the fact that he felt so identified with Harry meant that he was, which any pro, any good book, movie, novel, it's the protagonist we see ourselves inside of that protagonist. And so the fact that my son was saying he loved Harry, to me, it was like him saying that he loved himself, right? Because he was seeing himself through all of these adventures. So I, I, to be honest, the, the idea of the twin flame concept in another human is relatively new to me. But the thing that really lights me up and the thing that really feels exciting to me is this polarity of masculine and feminine inside of myself. And what I know is that the more balanced I can get and the more dexterous I can get inside of that polarity inside of me will exactly determine the quality of the relationship that I am in and the level of polarity that is available to us <clears throat> because it's an external mirror of what I have going on internally. You know, I've been studying a lot about hero's journey the last several years. And Joseph Campbell's hero's journey is this amalgamate. Are you familiar with the hero's journey? Uh, loosely, and I've, I've heard you talk about it. I've been studying the heroine's journey. So I'd love to talk about the hero heroine. It's, a, it's the same thing, right? I'd actually, I think, no, I, I disagree. I think that the her hero's journey is more external, right? Like, yes, of course, both, both all genders can take the hero's journey or the heroine's journey. But if the hero's journey is what can I create in the outside world, what trials, what tribulations, what ups, what's downs, what's learnings, um, the heroine's journey is how how deep into the underworld am I willing to venture? Like how much into my own emotional landscape am I willing to traverse? Which is a different way of applying that same sort of hero yeah, idea yeah. Mm -hmm. that is the internal landscape. Well, and that's, that is the beautiful alchemy that comes out of the Joseph Campbell, you know, aspect of this, the hero's journey in that the entire shift that happens in the hero is an internal one. Mm-hmm. Because he realizes that what we see on the outside is really just a reflection of what is us on the inside. And this, this realization is the most powerful aspect. And in every case, the hero, we often uh, love to talk about and list off the, the core strengths of the hero. Maybe they can fly. Maybe they've got some superpower. They've got magic like Harry Potter. But in every case, what makes them real to us and makes them identifiable that we fall in love with these heroes is actually the accumulation and combination of their powers and their flaws. The flaws make them human yeah. and why we can identify with them. Mm -hmm. So every hero must have these quote unquote flaws until he realizes that they are not in fact flaws. But the very thing that makes the superpowers super, 
just in an opposite sense. Mm. These same flaws are the lead that transmutes into gold. Mm. Because light cannot be its brightest. The night is darkest just before the dawn. Mm -hmm. And that's the most powerful story for me. And the power of this concept of a alchemical union in this embodiment. And a lot of people go through this experience of twin flame and a lot is spoken of it. And I think, you know, a lot of times people think that they've had a twin flame union experience. They haven't yet, but if, and when you do, you will know because literally as Carl Jung describes it, it is such a powerful and transformative experience in your life. And the, the sex alchemy becomes tantric. It becomes a process of worship. Yeah. Of the divine. When I, when I met Adam, my, my partner, he put his hands on my feet and I had a full Kundalini awakening. Like this surge of energy went from the bottom of my feet and it felt like it exploded out of the top of my head. By the way, it was... My eyes were closed. I was on his, his opus, this like vibroacoustic meditation sound bed. So I was on that. It was not a sexual experience. He just, <laughs> he just touched my feet and like, boof, and he said it felt like. Where, his where do we buy exploded. this bed? Where do we buy this <laughs> thing? Feelopus.com. <laughs> They're just starting pre orders, but it's um, <laughs> it was wild. And then I was like, was this the bed or was it you? Like, I didn't know, but I just took the head, I took the, my eye mask off and I was like, who are you? What is this? And I've seen that happen now repeatedly, repeatedly. Like, they aren't necessarily having full Kundalini awakenings, but people are going into those gamma states from it. But I'm just speaking to that. And then when you speak of the worship, like I always speak about Adam in the way that it feels like I am the lucky recipient of him worshiping the divine feminine through me. And then, yes, it is sort of about Emily Fletcher, but not really. It's like this deep devotion and this deep service to the capital G goddess that I happen to be the lucky vessel for. And it's such a wild experience. It's unlike anything I've ever danced with before. Wow. So yeah. that that can be so beautiful and so powerful. And these are the topics that people don't generally talk about. And I, yeah. I want to thank you for your work mm -hmm. and for addressing these topics. And hopefully I've given you some ideas to think about um, that might somehow augment or in some way reframe some of the way you've been thinking about it and teaching it too. Yeah. I'm already so excited to listen to this and take notes and just go and, and especially the stone piece of like, what are, what are the frequencies of those stones? How could we use those stones to help us even as talismans on this journey? Right. Cause you know, with the body likes ritual, the body likes ceremony because it's a 3d manifestation of something that's happening on a very ephemeral plane. So I feel very excited to deepen and, and, and wind these paths together. Yes, and they do all have musical notes that uh, that resonate them. Mm. And one of the I mean, things I'd love we'll to be know doing the notes Egypt, for the twenty four chakras. I have them all. Okay, great. And so that's one of the things we're we're going to do when we go to Egypt as well is that we're going to be singing at each of the pyramids in each of the locations the different notes that resonate. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you so much for one, this vision, two, executing on it, three, magnetizing so many amazing superheroes to come together and and strengthen it. That feels like to me, like you said, you know, Matthias gets his downloads, you get yours. To me, the the visions that I'm having are these light workers coming together, standing in a circle, almost like, you know, just like having each other's back increasing the size of the collective antenna, which will inevitably change the transmission and, and then, and then broadcasting this out, um, which, you know, Opus might have something to do with that. There are these beds where you can literally live stream someone's consciousness into the nervous systems of many people at once. So this is, it's coming soon, but there's, there's so much cool. No pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> coming soon. That's right. Come together right now. <laughs> Pre-order, uh -huh. you're coming soon. Um, so <laughs> I really want to encourage you. I'm not saying this facetiously. I'm saying this seriously. I love the idea of a make love, not war, global, yeah. meditative, um, kundalini activation. Experience. Activation. Yeah. I don't and think I anyone's done it before. 
It What's doesn't that? have to be in the, it, I don't think anyone's done it before. It doesn't have to be in the same stadium. Everyone can be in the, you know, the confinement of their, their own homes, but connecting yep. their hearts energetically yeah. and, this, and this meditatively. Like, yeah, you're absolutely right. So we're doing an at-home retreat in, in two weeks. And the idea was that I wanted people to be able to experience these modalities from the safety and comfort of their own home, to be initiated into the practices first and at home. And then of course I do in-person retreats as well. But this an idea of like, let's just pun intended, come together, put our attention on the world that we want to create and create a giant global antenna. Um, like this to me feels very exciting and very relevant. Um, so, Make love, yes. not war. Make love, not war. Uh-huh. Come together. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Oh, and then eventually, and this is salient too, the new vision is that we'll be doing activations at different sacred sites around the world. Yes, so we we're will. doing it in person there and then live streaming them out. But Each of the, the sites around the world have musical notes too, and they're all in the mm -hmm. same grid pattern. Okay. It's all based yeah, on the 24 quarter tone scale. Yeah, and this I would love your guidance on. This is, like, where I'll, be, the, I'll where be, be the first it. one. Yeah, I'll be teaching it when we're in Egypt mm -hmm. also. Okay. Uh, I presented on it um, at the uh, conference on procession and ancient knowledge uh, with several scholars in that field about you know a week ago, mm. and I couldn't believe it. You know, all these people that have been studying pyramid technology and and ancient civilizations like Graham Hancock and Chris Dunn and uh, Jimmy Corsetti, all these people that have been in this field for a long time, uh, I was shocked at their response to the revelation. And I say the term revelation because it is that each of the pyramids are actually musical intervals. Mm. And it's proven. It's a self-evident fact by their mathematics of proportion. Mm. And, and what we will be doing is we're going to be activating as well the crown chakra, which has two pyramids. And the crown chakra is in a place called Abu Rawash, which is eight kilometers north west of the Giza Plateau. Mm. And these were the two biggest pyramids. Actually, this pyramid and it's been destroyed in part but it sits 300 feet higher than the Giza plateau its peak would have stood 600 feet high compared to the great pyramids 481 feet and it's called the jed Ephra pyramid the jed raising the jed okay and this is the crown chakra it represents the pineal gland the pyramid satellite right next to it is the exact mathematics of the pineal gland and the pituitary gland in totality. One is a equilateral triangle. The other is a 5, 12, 13 triangle, the same on the backside of the dollar bill mm. and the eye of providence that comes along with it. So we'll be visiting this place, Abu Rawash as well. And we'll also be beginning the global activation of the crown chakra. So we'll be closing off the self-transcendence layer of the throat chakra, which represents transcendence of duality. Mm transcendence of duality the most significant form of duality we experience is time itself mm. this is why why i teach meditation in some degree is that in, in the style of meditation that i teach you get to transcend thinking and when you transcend thinking you transcend time because time is a function of thought so if you're moving beyond the realm of thinking then you're moving beyond the realm of time and so you get to experience that absoluteness which does change your relationship with manifesting but this feels so exciting and so relevant and and in some degree I mean, it's different but also like what i've dedicated my whole life to is just to give people at least a taste of that the way they can do it in a, in a repeatable self-sufficient fashion to go beyond that duality of time to remember that they are god pretending to be human in a way that they don't have to necessarily go to a jungle or rely on a substance so they can just close their eyes and do that every day, twice a day. And I'm so excited to do that with you in these sacred locations. I am too. I am too. I'm excited to, uh, to meet you in person. And I know we're going to have a discussion there also um, mm -hmm. on, on your podcast. So I'm super thrilled about that. But uh, I want to thank you for your time today. You brought so much wisdom and so much positive energy uh, and candor. And thank you so much for what you're doing in the world to help people to transcend and understand that the experiences we have every day don't have to just be horrible, difficult experiences. Yeah. Yeah. When they we really can, can shift our, our own medicine journeys. Yeah. It's our gold. Yeah. Right. And that's the beauty of this transcendent way of thinking. 
you know, it's very difficult to change somebody's perception, but what you can do is to shift their perspective Mm. by allowing them to feel empathy for an alternative viewpoint. This is what geometry does. This is what your practice of meditation is working towards. That's what sex magic does as well. It expands our consciousness in much the same way the one who has divided himself or herself into the many, simply for the joy of experiencing this process of becoming one again, is doing with us each and every day. Each of us serves a beautiful purpose. No ego is bad. Every one of us is doing exactly what we are meant to do. Mm. Mm. There's fractals of God again and again and again. In this beautiful divine play. And it's about learning the acceptance of our total self, not just the side of us that we want to show the world, but inclusive of the side that we've been hiding, the vulnerable aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Herman Hesse's Damien, he says, God is not just God of the light. God is God of all of it. Exactly right. And it even says that in the Bible. I was mm-hmm. reading a, a verse in, uh, in Ezekiel that said exactly that, that, you know, God creates the light of form and the darkness that surrounds it. Yeah, we, Alan Watts says, you know, we cannot see the white without the black. It's why in the yin and the yang, there is the black dot inside of the white. There is the white dot inside of the black because we can't, we literally can't even see one without the other. You are such a wonderful person with such a mm. gigantic heart. Thank you mm. for everything you do. And thank you for being on this with me today. Uh, keep blessing the world with your spirit and do the global come together. I would love to see it. Great. From your lips to God's ears. It's on the way. Okay. <laughs> on the way. Yeah. All and right. if folks well, want to check it out and sec- learn about it, it's just at zivameditation.com is where they can find all the all the goodness. So zivameditation.com. They can find yeah. you also on Instagram where I follow you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They can find you on Emily Fletcher. Uh, you have a website also. Uh, so yeah, Ziva so Meditation is the main place. Ziva for Meditation, to go. and on Instagram, it's at Ziva Meditation, or my personal is at Emily Stella Fletcher. And um, yeah, those are the best places. And, and we do have a free masterclass. Like, and we didn't even really talk about meditation that much. But if people want to learn the Ziva technique, which is what I taught Aubrey and Vailana and Layla and Regina, um, they think there's a free masterclass, which is zivameditation.com slash podcast. It just goes into a bit of the neuroscience of why this particular style of meditation is so effective at helping you to transcend that duality of time, to step beyond the intellect and really have a visceral experience of everythingness. And this is our new mission at Ziva, right? It's just to help people turn up the dial on their own divinity. Because reality is we are already God. We just forgot a little bit. So we just need to remember. (laughs) And we do that through all of these amazing practices. And truly, it's such an honor to get to be here and share this space with you and to get to swim in your vast intellect and, and an intellect that's so vast that it's even unioned with the heart and with love, which is really beautiful. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to have everyone in Egypt learn your Ziba. Uh, meditation as well. And I know that, uh, that blue is working on that. Um, and I'm just thrilled to have met you. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure.